I'm with David Buller from the American Cancer Research Center in Denver. David, along with Judy Burgoon, is the author of Interpersonal Deception Theory. What is the gist of the theory? Well, the gist of Interpersonal Deception Theory is an attempt to explain how deception works within communication environments and to move it out of solely being concerned with what people are thinking and maybe individual behaviors they might omit when they deceive, but talk more about deception as it occurs in the interchange between people, because that's really where it happens. So it's interactive. Right. Right, and that's why we call it interpersonal deception theory rather than just deception theory. It seems like if I know a person, we're, we're good friends, mm -hmm. or we're married, or mm -hmm. if sure. I really know a person, would I be better at detecting deception? Most of the research would say no. <laughs> yeah, most of the research would say you're, the, the nature of that relationship is positive, it's trusting, you think that person is doing things in your best interest, would lead you to believe most of what they say to you. And in fact, even what, there's evidence that even when people suspect they're being deceived in those relationships, they try hard to come up with other explanations for it or at least they'll compartmentalize that thought. Okay, so that's truth bias to the max. Right, and there's a general tendency for that. Now, will I be able to know you a little better and come up with information to validate? Possibly. Mm -hmm. And so maybe I'll think something's, again, amiss, but I'm not willing to say you're deceiving me because I've got you so far on that end of trust, which is I trust you, you're looking out for my best interests. In fact, if I find out you lie, I might say, well, they did that for a good reason. Because? Because they love me, yeah. you know, they're my best friend. You know, they would never do this to me. I, I understand that you and Judy as empiricists, as behavioral scientists, have to take a step back mm -hmm. and take a look at what is right. rather than what ought to be. And yet, as you write up your theory, you do say that you think that there, is a, that there are times when this is beneficial, and you say you judge it on the basis of motive, right. is that right? That's your personal commitment? Motive and, uh, I think it would be motive and outcome uh, of it. There's, the, the reason we took that position was saying, if you can divorce the morality from it, then we will get a better picture of this. Because we felt that one of the reasons why the early research focused so much on what did the person lying do and think and could we tell that what they were doing and thinking was because people had the belief that all lying was was bad, that it was something that wasn't appropriate and we needed to know when it happened. Cicela Bach in her book Lying suggests that it's very dangerous to go on the basis of outcome, to be a utilitarian because we always give ourselves the break. We, right. we, we think, well, this will really not hurt. Right. And, and she would say that there's almost a weight being carried around li line right. that, that has to be factored in. Right. Would you agree with that? I would. I, I think it's not just outcome. I, what I was saying is how do you judge it? Do you judge it based on the behavior, which in our case we were saying don't judge it on the basis of the behavior. We have to understand the behavior and then we have to judge it in other ways, whether it be the motives that they have, the benefits they think they're obtaining from it. Um, and I think that's the way people really do look at it. Um, I mean, the example might be um, this idea that finding out the you love of You are looking me in the eyes now. I know, but you see, that's because I'm thinking <laughs> here. Uh, but, you know, you asked me the question of, of lying to your, to your uh, closest friends mm -hmm. or your lover or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, and one might argue there might be reasons why you would think it was appropriate. For their sake. For their sake. Now, I do believe, right. which Paul Ekman has written, which is people overestimate the extent to which their deceptions benefit other people, and right. I think that's probably true. I mean, there's a lot of instrumental value for me if I'm the deceiver. Let's move back to the empirical. And mm -hmm. in your theory, you have a series of uh, propositions. Right. One says that as truth bias goes up, mm -hmm. as, as I think you will tell the truth to me, my fear of detection goes down. Right. Okay. If I know you well, my fear of detection will go up. Right. But the theory doesn't say which of those is stronger. In other words, those conflict. Right. 
I mean, okay. We, yeah, that, in other words, you're in process. Right. We're in process. We don't know, and there's a lot where we tried to stake out based on what we could see in the research, as well as thinking about what we felt happened and make predictions about certain ways in which certain factors affected this. But we don't know a lot of these things because they have never been tested like that. You've conducted a dozen, two dozen Quite you and Judy uh, right. together and students of yours, right. uh, when you were at the university, have conducted dozens of studies right. in interpersonal deception. Have you found something that was a gee whiz finding? A, uh, wow, I didn't know that. Maybe the gee whiz is just the complications that arise in this. The, of how many different factors, once you start stopping and thinking about this. I mean. Our theory is unlike others in that we don't try to just simply have a single factor that is producing all of the behavior, even two factors. Is the more you think about this and the more you look at what's happening, the more you think could be affecting it. That this is a multi-layered process and it's not as simple as do you feel guilty, do you fear detection, and therefore how are you going to respond? 